Okay. Welcome to Fellowship with the Holy Spirit uh, class. And the objective of this class is to train you on how to live in relationship with your maker. And this will give you lasting purpose and satisfaction in life. So my goal in this whole course is to train you on how to live with your maker. Um, how to fellowship with the Holy Spirit, how to abide in Jesus. There's different ways to say it. Um, and my name is Ben, and um, my journey has, uh, I grew up in a Baptist church, and um, I got saved at an early age and really sensed that I needed a Savior, loved reading the Word, talking to people about Jesus, but basically heard nothing about the person of the Holy Spirit. That, that term may have been used, I just don't remember it. And so I got into high school and then into college, and I got into um, immorality, and I felt such conviction about it, but I didn't know how to... It's like I knew I was forgiven of my sins, but I didn't know how to live victorious. I didn't know how to break patterns in my life. And then um, some other situations were happening in my life during that time, and it's like the pressure was on me, and um, had some, some car accidents, had relationships that were, weren't working out. I was about to graduate college, and I really didn't know how to live in the real world in a sense, so I just wanted to stay in college. And so during that time, it all got me turning t toward the Lord instead of running away, and through that season of my life, I was introduced to the Holy Spirit, and I learned about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I became just more hungry for that. And uh, it was just amazing. Got baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Lord taught me about fasting and praying in tongues, meditating on the scriptures, and all these things that I, I didn't really learn growing up. And uh, I wasn't reading about them in books yet necessarily either. The Lord was just teaching me these things, and it was, um, it was actually at the University of Georgia where all that was happening, and then, um, and then I moved from there to do full-time ministry, though my degree was in animal science, but I ended up doing full-time ministry and going to um, a place that does a lot of prayer and um, have spent the last 17 years or so doing that. And uh, it was through those beginning days, and then as time went by, spending time in prayer, the Lord just taught me spiritual disciplines and how to seek Him and how to fellowship with Him, and this class is the product of that. And so I just want to pass along to you what I feel like the Lord has given to me. So um, let's pray, and then we'll jump in. So Father, we thank you for this class. We thank you for uh, this time to just be able to get to know you more. We ask you for the Holy Spirit. We ask you for this friend that sticks closer than a brother and guides us into all truth, who teaches us how to abide in Jesus is with us always, abides with us forever. Thank you, Lord. Help me to just give out what you have given to me, Lord. I pray for the ability to hear and the ability to receive, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you see the gray box in the notes? We call them gray boxes. Um, there's a question there. What are your desired outcomes of fellowship with a person? So just think about someone you enjoy hanging out with, whether it be a spouse or a parent or uh, just a, a buddy. And think of just what are some words that come to mind when you think about what am I wanting from fellowship with that person? So just take a minute and write down a couple of, couple of words there. All right, you may have more in your mind, and that's fine. Uh, when we do these gray boxes, you may not always finish, um, but you can, you'll be able to go back later. 
if you like. So throw out a couple of words that you want in fellowship with another. What's some things you wrote down? Two-way communication. Two-way communication. Trust. Trust. Laughter. Laughter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Shared passion. Shared passion. Presence. Presence. Spurs me on and challenges me. Healthy roles. Acceptance. Is there anything negative you want from fellowship? No. And then how about, it's probably kind of like Nate's uh, word, but how about discipline? Do you want discipline? Correction? Those are ones that we don't like as much, maybe necessarily, because of our past experiences with people we can see. Um, but that is that is something that we should want out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, um, because He knows best. You know, He knows all about us. He knows the things that actually hinder us from what we really want, which is fellowship with Him. Um, but He works through partnerships, so He has to identify those things, and you have to disagree with them so that you can agree with the right things. And so the reason that you guys want all those things you want is because you're made in God's image and he made you for fellowship. And, uh, and he wants that fellowship even more than you do. I mean, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, which implies he wants you to always be with him. He wants you to be dependent on him. It's the way that you were made. We'll probably get into it more later, but you were made to depend. You weren't you don't actually function through independence. That's not how you were created. And so you were made to be dependent on your maker. And then as the body of Christ, we only work best when we're dependent on each other. We see the full picture together. That's why it's so important to move together as the body and not get isolated. Okay, uh, moving down to Roman numeral one. Fellowship, this is just kind of my definition that I've wrestled with and, and uh, chewed on over the years. It's cultivating relationship with God, and then from the cultivation of that relationship, learning how to walk with Him. You know, you, you, when you're, you're married or any relationship, you have to spend time with that person and cultivate that relationship, and it's not always easy, right? Right? Um, but as you cultivate that relationship, they come to know you and you come to know them. And so you learn how to walk together. The prophet Amos said, how can two walk together unless they agree to do so? And so to be able to walk with the Holy Spirit, you have to agree with his ways. And sometimes we don't always agree with his ways, um, and how he wants to work in our life and, uh, the things that wrestling with even uh, things that the word says. And so um, that's walked out over time and that fellowship becomes sweeter and sweeter over time because of the history. And so um, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So it's available to all of us, this rich, deep fellowship and actually, the very fellowship that Jesus had when he walked the earth, it's yours, and it's mine, and we get to do that together, and we'll talk about that more a little later. Um, the Holy Spirit, he guides you into all truth, and um, he abides with you forever. So he's with you forever. He's not going away, and he's guiding you into all truth, and if you know truth, then you know every lie. You know what the truth is. And um, no one wants to fellowship with you more than your maker does. You think about the person that you enjoy being with the most. The Holy Spirit wants to fellowship with you more than that person does. Um, and that's just, just an amazing thought to think about. Um, it doesn't necessarily always feel that way, but the truth is, the one who made you wants to fellowship with you more than anybody else does. And then, um, you know, there's, there's lots of people, people have a lot of experience, uh, different experiences with the Holy Spirit. Um, 
And some of that, like my experience, was I didn't really know there was a Holy Spirit. Some people's experience, they hear that terminology all the time. Um, some other people's experience, it might be an anointing that comes on a person, like this presence that comes on a person, or it may be rolling around on the floor laughing. You know, that's what equals the Holy Spirit. But man, if you look in the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, here's a few things. He brings you to salvation. He's the one who convicted you of sin. He's the one who lets you know that you're justified, that you're innocent in the court of heaven by the blood of Jesus. He's the one who's sanctifying all of us, setting us apart and helping us to, to be transformed from glory to glory, to be conformed to the image of Jesus until we fall asleep or until Jesus comes. Um, he groans in us for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in our life and in the earth. And uh, he pours out his love in us. He gives us revelation of God's ways and God's plans. And um, he's earnestly counseling us. And there's a bunch of other stuff that he's doing um, through and in us. And so just want you to get that picture that the Holy Spirit is uh, pretty much all that happens in your Christian journey, it's because of him. He's the one who's involved in that process. And so, um, and then the other thing is the Holy Spirit consistently tells you of the eternal relationship that you have with the Father and with his Son, and that you've been adopted through Jesus Christ as his Son. And, and uh, the Bible talks about this. Uh, the goal of this is to make your joy full. In 1 John, John talks about that. So if you want, it's what I started with, uh, giving you lasting satisfaction and purpose in life. Um, what I mean by lasting satisfaction is giving you lasting joy, lasting contentment. And relationship with the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit, that is the foundation. It doesn't matter what you do in life, that is the foundation that relationship. And again, that relationship, it's an individual thing that I do within myself. There's rhythms that I do in my life to be diligent to steward that, but I can't, um, I can only go so far by myself. It's us together doing it. And even when you look at abiding, he is the branch, I mean, he is the vine and you are branches. Abiding is not just individual. Abiding is a corporate thing that we do together. And, um, Next, uh, think of the person you enjoy spending the most time with, your wife, a child, a friend. You enjoy spending time with them because you just enjoy their presence, their being, the essence of who they are, and um, the relationship, it makes, it makes your heart glad, and even, even though you don't always want to be disciplined or corrected, you know, or told like, hey, you should not walk that way, you should walk this way. You don't always want to hear that initially, but with that person, you trust that they're fighting for you, and so you're even willing to hear correction from them. And so um, think about the Holy Spirit, or let's go back to that person you enjoy spending time with. They can't be with you 100% of the time, right? And believe it or not, they they're, they're not going to think positively about you 100% of the time, all right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, he's inside of you. You can't get closer than inside of you. Like You can't get closer than that. And, um, and he, he doesn't think negatively about you. He's your greatest cheerleader. He's the one who's fighting for you when you're giving up. And, you know, as you fellowship with him, and as you cultivate that relationship over time, like when I get downcast in my soul, if I will humble myself and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, he'll remind me, hey, Ben, you're a son. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. I'm, 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 I'm taking you to Jesus. And then he re might remind me of a prophetic word from the past or some truth from Scripture. Because he guides me into all truth, truth sets me free. Well, it's setting me free from a lie against the knowledge of God. And so he's there to do that. You know, Proverbs 18, 24 says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. When I read that verse, I like to think about the Holy Spirit. 
And then Proverbs uh, 27, 9, it says, I uh, can't remember it word for word, so let me just look it up. It says, ointment and perfume delight the heart, and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. So just like a perfume, if I sprayed perfume right now, if y'all wait just a minute or so, it'll be in your nose, right? And it'll be, it'll be uh, fulfilling. And he's saying, the sweetness of a man's friend is like that. And so I like to use that verse and think of the Holy Spirit as my sweetest friend because he's giving me hearty counsel. You know, he's the one who's guiding me down the narrow and the difficult way and keeping me, keeping my perspective right. All right, so we're going to do the video um, and I'm going to set it up for us, uh, set the background of the, the clip up um, because... And the reason we're watching this video is videos are sometimes like parables. They, they allow us to see in the physical realm a reality in the unseen realm. And so the legend of Bagger Vance gives this video clip, gives a good image of this fellowship that we have with the Holy Spirit. So the legend of Bagger Vance is this story that takes place in Savannah, Georgia in the World War I Great Depression years, so 1920, 1930. And Matt Damon plays this uh, guy, his name is, I think it's Ran, Randolph Juna, and he, um, he's this golfer, this professional golfer, and he's real successful. And then World War I breaks out, and so he goes to fight in the forest of Europe, and a bunch of men go with him, and all of his, all of his men die except him. And so he comes back home, and the idea is, and he's beat up, and the idea is that he's lost his swing. He can't, he can't re-engage in life. And so he, he gives in to gambling and alcohol and such as that. And then um, the Great Depression hits, and he had a, a, a girlfriend before he went off to World War I. And this girlfriend, her dad, owns this big golf resort, and it's going to close down because of the Depression. And so they're going to have this big golf meet and bring in a couple of big golfers. But they need someone from Savannah to represent and so obviously Randolph Juno would be their, their representation, but he's, he's unwilling. And then um, this mysterious uh, caddy comes along, and it's Will Smith. And he comes along and uh, shows up at where Matt Damon is, is staying and basically convinces him to enter the golf tournament. And he encourages him, encourages him to get his swing back. And so in, in this, um, they're in the golf match, and he hits the ball, and it curves off into the woods. And um, so he goes into the woods in the, in the film clip, and he starts having flashbacks of World War I, and he wants to go back into his old patterns. And Will Smith comes along and encourages him out of that. So look at that as a picture of the Holy Spirit. When we get done with the clip, I'm not going to immediately start talking again. There's a, there's a gray box down here. And, and just take a minute or two and answer those questions, and then we'll continue on in the teaching. You gonna be one of a different club, Dale Junior? I can't do this. Hey, you 
Mine should just loose your grip up a smidge. You know, a man's grip on his club, just like a it's man's grip. It's not what I'm on... talking about. I know. No, you don't. What I'm talking about is a game. A game that can't be won, only played. You don't understand? I don't need to understand. Ain't a soul on this entire earth ain't got a burden to carry. He don't understand. You ain't alone in that. But you've been carrying this one long enough. Time to go on, lay it down. I don't know how. You got a choice. You can stop, or you can stop. Start? Walking. Where? Right back to where you always been, and then stand there. Still, real still, and remember, it's too long ago. Oh no, sir, it was just a moment ago. Time for you to come on out the shadows, Juna. Time for you to choose. I can't. Yes, you can. But you ain't alone. I'm right here with you. I've been here all along. I played a game. Your game. The one that only you was meant to play. One that was given to you when you come into this world. You ready? Take your stance. Strike that ball, Junior. Don't hold nothing back. Give it everything. Now's the time. Let yourself remember. Remember your swing. That's right, Junior. Settle yourself. Let's go. Now is the time, Junior. Page number two, and as you go there, what I want you to notice, one thing from that video that I wanted to highlight is notice that um, Ranoff, the guy who was hitting the golf ball, he actually had to choose if he was going to move forward or not. And uh, Bagger Vance or Will Smith there as the, as the the guy encouraging him, seeing that like as the Holy Spirit, like encouraging us, but we have to take risks, like we have to take steps forward, and as we do that, he empowers us, and so um, I just wanted to hit that point. So page two, why do we fellowship with the Holy Spirit? So it's cool that we're talking about this great relationship we have with the Holy Spirit, what, but what is the point of it? And um, the point is to abide in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is always leading you to Jesus. Now, I know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're all Yahweh. They're all the Lord. But in the mystery of how God works, he's chosen to give us this picture of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, um, and again, I mentioned it earlier, but the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything on his own. He does only what the Father and the Son give him to do in the believer. And that's John 16. And so... Uh, 
So the goal of fellowship, let me just re- repeat it again, is to abide in Jesus and to know we are not alone with a Father who accepts us and enjoys us. In John, John 13 through 17, you'll hear me talk about it a lot. If you're not familiar with it, real familiar with John 13 through 17, I admonish you to get really familiar with it. Um, and in there, in John 14 specifically, I believe that Jesus is identifying the deepest fear of the human heart, and he's answering it. He's answering the deepest longing. I think the deepest fear is the fear of being alone. He's saying, hey, I'm going to answer that by giving you the Holy Spirit. And then I think the deepest longing is to know that we are um, accepted and enjoyed by our maker, specifically its father, because Jesus was possessed in a healthy way with this father, father, father. And he wanted us to be able to have that same relationship. The Holy Spirit cries out within us what? Abba, Father. Of all things he could cry out, why does he cry Abba, Father? Just something for you to think about. And so, um, and then 1 John 2, 27, where I'm saying the Spirit teaches you to abide in Jesus, I'm getting that from 1 John 2, 27. And then um, focusing on the Holy Spirit is, n- is not going to diminish the focus on the Father and the Son. It's only going to increase it. And so, um, because, you know, you could get into, like, well, why do you talk to the Holy Spirit? Like, there's not Bible verses about that necessarily, like talking directly to the Holy Spirit. But what the Bible does tell us is that the Holy Spirit calls out Abba, Father, So the Holy Spirit's always directing us to the Father, and the Holy Spirit teaches us how to abide in Jesus. So, but how am I going to have a fellowship with someone that I'm not going to talk to, right? In like a personal way, not, uh, it's not just I'm seated in heavenly places out there somewhere in Christ, but actually Christ dwells in my heart by faith, and I have the Holy Spirit abiding here forever. So it becomes very personal and very close, and, um, and so, second point on why we fellowship with the Holy Spirit concerning abiding in Jesus is that you were made for dependency. I've already hit this point, but I just want to hit it again. Um, John fifteen five, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. So, if you, if you just reword that, he's basically saying, I always want you to be with me. And I don't ever get tired of you being with me because... That's the way I made you, to be with me. And, but on our part, it takes poverty of spirit. It takes lowliness of mind to be able to do that consistently. And then the next point is not actually in the notes. I added it before I came here. Just one little point. Um, that the Holy Spirit, his aim in your life is complete transformation. Complete confirmation, confirmation to the image of Jesus. That's what he's about. So if you want a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, you're going to lose your own life. That's the way Jesus worded it. Take up your cross and follow me. Trust me with your life. And just as I had a journey, you have a journey. But that journey is with me. So you have to abide in me. And fellowship with the Holy Spirit is the way to do that. And so... um, And so if you want to, again, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, he is going to help you overcome everything in your life that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Romans 8 says, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body. So if you're hanging out with the Holy Spirit, you're putting to death the misdeeds of the body. Galatians 5 says, walk in the Spirit or live by the Spirit, one of those phrases, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Like, it doesn't become clearer than that. If you're walking and living in agreement with the Holy Spirit, then you are not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So if you are fulfilling the lust of the flesh, even here and there, well, you just have to, you just have to own up to you're not fellowshipping, you're not abiding in that moment. And, um, and then in 1 Peter, it says uh, it's through the Spirit that we obey. And so... I'm just making the point that if you're going to hang out with the Holy Spirit, he's going to take you into holiness and righteousness. That's what he does. 
And so, um, who knows Reese Howells, who's heard that name? Okay, well, Reese Howells, if you don't know that name, he, write, he, he lived... Um, he lived like 1879 and 1950. He lived through World War I and World War II, and he had a rich relationship with the Holy Spirit and, um, and, and just learned how to walk with him. So I want to read. Uh, it's not on your paper there. It's on a paper I have up here. But I want to read a couple of things from that book about. Um, so he got, he got saved or born again, but he didn't really know about the Holy Spirit. And then three years later, he basically gets probably what we would call baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, what was happening is he went to this convention, and on his way to this convention, the Lord said to him, when you return, you will be a new man. And he just heard, he just heard that. And then when he was there, he was listening to this guy talk about the Holy Spirit. And, um, and how the guy was talking about how the Holy, Holy Spirit desires full possession of those he indwells because he lives in human bodies, right? And uh, it says that Reese said, the Holy Ghost appeared to me and I knew him to be the one who had spoken to me the day before about being a new man. It never dawned on me before that the Holy Ghost was a person exactly like the Savior and he must come and dwell in flesh and blood. In fact, the church knows more about the Savior who was only on the earth uh, 33 years than about the Holy Ghost who has been here 2,000 years. I had only thought of him as an influence coming on meetings, and that was what most of us in the revival thought. I had never seen that he must live in bodies as the Savior lived on the earth. And then a little bit later, he goes, uh, this is like what he's hearing from the Lord. As the Savior had a body, so I dwell in the cleansed temple of the believer. I am a person, I am God, and I am come to ask you to give your body to me that I may work through it. I need a body for my temple, but it must belong to me without reserve, for two persons with different wills can never live in the same body. Will you give me yours? But if I come in, I come as God, and you must go out. I shall not mix myself with yourself. Pretty intense, huh? And then um, he made it very plain to me that he would never share my life. I saw the honor he gave me in the offering to indwell me, but there were many things very dear to me, and I knew he wouldn't keep one of them. The change he would make was very clear. It meant every bit of my fallen nature was to go to the cross, and he would bring in his own life and his own nature. And of course, that happened over time. I saw that the Holy Ghost in me, I saw that only the Holy Ghost in me could live like the Savior. So our abiding in Jesus and being like Jesus and all that, it's only because of the Holy Spirit and our fellowship with him. And um, it was only a question of the loss there would be in doing it. And then he, he basically says, I didn't give my answer in a moment. And then the Lord worked on him over days, over the love of money, reputation, ambition, all these things. And, um, and that's how, that was his experience of getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. So just to reemphasize that point, like if you really want a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then he really will sanctify you, and you really will die. Your old man will die and stay dead. You know, you, you know how you died with Christ? He will teach you how to stay dead so that his life can live through you. And he works that out over time and over seasons. Um, okay, so how did Jesus fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus became, he's God, but he chose to dwell in flesh and blood, right? And he chose to be fully dependent on the Father. Philippians 2 talks about that. He made himself nothing. And so, um, and it says he sympathized with us in our weaknesses, right? And so, how can he sympathize with us unless he had to live dependent like we have to? And so, and in Hebrews 9, 14, it says, through the Spirit, he offered himself unblemished to God. That's an amazing verse. The, the way he resisted sin to the point of bloodshed every day of his life leading up to the cross, through the Spirit, that's how he did it. He fellowshiped with the Holy Spirit as a man, as a human. And, um, and then he did that to show us a pattern and a template 
and to bring us into that same fellowship as, yes, as individuals, but as his body and him as the head. And, uh, and then just the big picture, through that fellowship with the Holy Spirit, we make disciples of all nations. And then when someone from that final tribe receives the gospel um, through our corporate fellowship and corporate abiding over these 2,000 years, that's when the king returns and reigns on, on earth as in heaven. All right, so uh, moment by moment, he abided in the Father's love as he depended on the Spirit. Um, and so I'm going to read a verse here. It's not typed up there, but it's in John 5. So roughly in the Gospel of John, chapters 5 through 8, Jesus teaches us how he abided in the Father. And then in John 13 through 17, he teaches us how to abide in him. So in John 5, 19, it says that, uh, so Jesus was being persecuted because he healed someone on the Sabbath. And this is how he responded to it. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing by himself. How often do you say that of yourself, that you can do nothing by yourself? Do you live that dependent? God in the flesh said, I can do nothing by myself. And then even that term, the son, do do you guys know where that's coming from? Where is he pulling from in the Old Testament when he says the son? Anybody have a guess? Psalm 2. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make your na- the nations your inheritance. Jesus, he knows he's the king of the nations. When he says the son, that's what he means. I'm the king of the nations. He knows that. The king of the nations can do nothing by himself. That's how he walked as a man. And then it says, this is why he did nothing by himself. Uh, verse 20. The father loves the son. How confidently do you, can you say that about yourself? The father loves you, Ben. And you, it's not just head knowledge. Like it's an experiential, deep knowing that settles everything for you. And so that's how he could do nothing by himself. He's like, I don't want to do anything by myself. I want to abide in my father. And then the next thing, and shows him all things that he himself does. So Jesus, his view of life was, I abide in my Father through the Holy Spirit and uh, because he loves me, and then he tells me what he's doing, and then I do that, and I leave the results up to him, and I don't get haughty about it because I can't do anything without him anyway. And so the idea is that Jesus found his success in being loved by the Father, not by what he did. So imagine being able to live that way. (laughs) My success is I'm just loved, I'm already victorious, I'm successful, and then, sure, drive out a demon, raise the dead, preach the gospel, someone gets saved, cool revelation, write a book. None of it matters. I mean, it matters, it's significant, but you realize that's all, a man can only receive what's given to him from heaven. And so you receive that, and having that revelation, it keeps you from this productive success mentality, even though in the grace of God, we want to be successful and productive and do those things, but your filter by which you view all of that uh, can be uh, completely different if you view it this way. And so it's freeing, it's restful, you know, it's that Jesus, come to me and learn from me, and uh You'll have rest in your souls. All right, so um, Jesus gave us the same pattern. So that John 5, 19 through 20, and he kind of says similar things in chapter 6, 7, and 8. And if you're wondering about the Holy Spirit thing, like there's the Hebrews 9 piece, but like in John, in John 6, he's talking about I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven to give my life for the world. And he says... Um, a little bit later in there, uh, he says, if you want to abide in me, you got to drink my blood. you got to eat my flesh. And they're thinking, like, what in the world? Like, cannibal? Like, you're crazy. Because they were thinking just through natural mindsets. And then he says, uh, 
the flesh counts for nothing. The spirit gives life. So he's, he's giving you the picture. Like, he's not saying, no, I want, I want you to, like, literally eat my body. He's saying, what I'm doing in front of you, it's not my flesh. It's by the spirit that I'm doing this. And so that's kind of the general idea. And then John 15, he gives us the same pattern. So in John 15, 5, he says, without me, you can do nothing. He said the son can do nothing by himself. He says, without me, you can do nothing, right? And then in verse 9, he goes, as the fathers love me, the father loves the son, right? John 5, as the fathers love me, I've loved you. Abide in my love. So he's saying, I love you just like the Father loves me. And the Father loves you, actually, just like he loves me. And then you go on down to verse 15. He says, no longer do I call you servants. A servant does not know what his master is doing. I've called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I've made known to you. And in John 5, the rendition would be, my Father shows me what he's doing, and I do it. And so here in John 15, he's saying, you can't do anything without me. Stay in my love, and you're my friend. If you, if you obey me, my commands to love me and then love your neighbor, you're my friend, and I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'll tell you what I'm doing in this place. I'll tell you what I'm doing in your marriage or individual lives, and you can do it. And so that's the pattern that he gives us, and just the, the caveat would be that we, yes, we do that individually, but we're doing that together as the body of Jesus, and that's why we need each other. Here's my, here's my uh, five words for defining abiding, or let's just say two words. Dependency, dialogue. For me, that's abiding. For me, that's fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Dependence, this, this not thinking of myself more highly than I ought, knowing that I'm a little child and I need to stay a little child, and then I need to stay in the conversation. I just need to converse with God, specifically in places of pain where it's easy to get offended, and especially when you're hurt by your own brother or sister. They didn't show up on time. They said that I could do this, but then they didn't follow through on their word, and all these little little petty things that happen in our lives. And I say petty. I say that. I'm not meaning that they don't hurt. They do. They hurt. But the point is you have to learn how to converse with Jesus about that and know that he cares about the pain. And then from there, you can see that well, you've done that before too, Ben. <laughs> and so you can have, it gets your perspective right, and then you can have mercy on your brother or your sister, and then you can stay free because what happens is the, the enemy seeks to get you offended, but the, ch the problem with that is it actually disrupts what you most want, which is fellowship with your maker. Because if he can get you to believe lies, it disrupts your fellowship with your maker, and then it ultimately dis it, it disrupts your fellowship with your brother and your sister. And that's what you don't want. And so the Holy Spirit will keep you. He'll keep you in the abiding. He'll keep you in the pocket if you'll let him. And, um, but there's, there's a dying process there. Um, and, and a lot of the dying is you have to let go of taking revenge in your own strength. You have to let go of your hurts and all that kind of stuff, and that's a pretty consistent thing in life. Um, and then, all right, so lastly, I think on this part, um, there's a little tool that I came up with. There's all kinds of tools you can use, right? You know, there's not this, this like, one tool for everybody kind of thing, but... Uh, these are things that can help us grow. And so I based, it's called AFR. I couldn't think of something that would spell a nice word, so it's just AFR. Um, and it's off of Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. And it's just a way to begin to pray. You can memorize this thing pretty quick by just praying it. <clears throat> but it's a way to engage with the Holy Spirit inside of you. And we're, we'll work on this later when we do the kind of uh, the, the modeling time where you get to practice. But it's acknowledging the spirit within you, focusing on the spirit's desire rather than your own abilities, and then receiving God's power to abide in his love. And it's all based off of Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. We'll go back to that a little bit later. Um, last point here, 
before we do the um, next little video thing. Um, yes, transformation takes time. That's my last point. So be gentle with yourself because the Lord is gentle with you. And um, there's this little book called The Oak Inside the Acorn by Max Licato. And I cry a lot when I read it because it's about this little girl and I have a little girl. Um, and we're going to watch some, some parts of that. The Oak Inside the Acorn by Max Licardo. The acorn looked at the world around him. Green hills rolled their backs in the distance. Bright daisies bloomed below him. Above him, a family of puffy white clouds floated through the blue sky. The world looks so big, the little acorn said to his mother. I'm just glad to be right here with you. His mother was a tall, beautiful oak tree. I'm glad too, my little acorn. It's good for you to be here with me now. But when your time comes to go into the world, you'll be fine. I'll be afraid, he said. Mother Oak hugged little acorn in her strong branches. Within you is a great oak, little acorn. Just be the tree that God made you to be. The thought of letting go and leaving the safety of his mother's branches was scary to little acorn, so he tried not to think about it. But deep down inside, he knew the time was coming. One by one, his brothers and sisters had been letting go and saying goodbye. They had been afraid too, but their mother had assured them with the same words, Within you is a great oak. Just be the tree God made you to be. Each time he heard this little acorn would look at himself and say, An oak tree? In me? He was so small, it was hard for him to believe that he could ever be a tree. When the sun warmed his branches, little oak awoke. Only he wasn't so little anymore. He could see further. He had grown taller and wider. The winds didn't bend him as much. His branches were as big as his trunk used to be. Little oak was becoming big oak. Many years passed and each year he grew bigger and wider, wider and bigger until everything in the farmer's yard looked up at him. Can you see all the changes? How big he's gotten? Now Orange Tree and the flowers called him Big Oak. He spread his big branches and looked around. Orange Tree was taller too, but not as tall as Big Oak. Big Oak was taller than all his friends. They were wide, but not as wide as Big Oak. He was the tallest. He was the widest. But he still wondered, what was he supposed to do? He couldn't grow oranges or flowers. He just grew bigger, and he didn't know why. Big Oak was just awakening from a long winter's nap, his leaves, tiny buds, when a young farmer brought two ropes and tied them to one of his strong branches. Close by, a little girl watched. Rosie Rose was puzzled. What's it for, Big Oak, she asked. I don't know, Big Oak answered, but he soon found out. Can I do it, Daddy? Can I swing? Go ahead, urged the man, and the little girl with bright blue eyes and hair the colour of daisies flowers sat in the swing. Big Oak felt the tug, but barely. He was strong and the little girl was small. With her daddy's help, she swung forward, not too far, but further the next day and further the next. By the time the sun was hot and the flowers were plenty, she could swing along, kicking her feet higher and higher until she could see the roof of her house. Then back she would swing, back until she seemed to look straight at the ground. Big Oak loved the sound of the little girl's laughter, her footsteps running towards him, her squeals of delight as she swung higher and higher into the sky. Yes, Big Oak loved little girl. When she swung, he stood strong. When her daddy built her a tree house in the big oak's branches, Big Oak gladly held it. When little girl stretched out on the grass to watch the clouds float, Big Oak shaded her. She played in his branches, climbed his trunk, rested in his shadow, and together they grew. Each year, both grew taller. Each year, both grew stronger. 
When grey skies brought cold days, Big Oak slept and the swing hung silent and the playhouse stayed empty. When blue skies brought warm days, they laughed and played. A little girl talked and he listened. And at last Big Oak knew that he had become the tree God made him to be. One day, little girl came to Big Oak with a little boy, though neither was too little. They sat on his branches and talked. Big Oak held them both, and when they carved their names on his trunk, he didn't mind. Little boy pushed the swing, little girl laughed, and Big Oak protected them from the sudden rain. In time, little girl didn't swing so much anymore. When she climbed into the treehouse, she sat more and played less. Little girl was becoming Big Girl. Big Girl now stood as tall as Big Oak's lowest branch. One day, Rosie Rose said to Big Oak, She is growing up, Big Oak. She'll soon be leaving us. Big Oak didn't answer, but he understood. Big Girl spent many blue sky days sitting on the ground, leaning back against Big Oak's trunk and watching the clouds drift by. Big Oak knew Big Girl had a big question on her mind because she said things like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be. And it's hard to let go. And oh, how can I know who I am? Big Oak wanted to talk to Big Girl. He knew just what to say. He would say, within you is a great girl. Just be the person God made you to be. Orange trees grow oranges, he would say. Flower plants grow flowers. And oaks? Oaks grow tall enough for swings and strong enough for swinging and big enough to hold little girls until they become big girls. He wanted to, but he couldn't say the words. One day, Big Girl was so sad. The little girl was used, that used to giggle in Big Oak's shade just sat, silent tears flowing down her cheeks. It's hard to let go, she said. Big Oak was listening and he had an idea. He looked down his branch at a little acorn. I have a special job for you, Big Oak said. The next time the wind blew his branches, Big Oak let this branch shake more than the others. The little acorn popped loose and landed in the big girl's lap. Big Girl picked it up and started to toss it away, but stopped. She held the little acorn in her hand and stared at it. She turned and looked up at Big Oak. Were you ever this small? Answering her own question, she continued, Of course you were. You grew into a great oak from a little acorn. All you did was become what God made you to be. She looked again at the acorn, then back at the tree. Her eyes brightened. Do you suppose that's what God wants me to do? Big Oak wanted to shout, yes, but he didn't have to. Big Girl stood and announced, of course he does. Now it's time for me to let go and become the person God made me to be. Big Girl smiled, placed the acorn in her pocket, and began walking away. But after a few steps, she stopped and turned. She looked at the swing, the tree house. She looked at Big Oak. She walked over to him and placed a hand on his trunk. Without a word, she said goodbye. Without a word, Big Oak said the same. Okay. So what I want to do is take like the next 30 or 40 minutes and let you guys just practice. And so you can answer the gray box, and then what I want you to do is in the notes where you have the AFR, um, it's page two, the bottom of page two. Um, basically, what I want you to do is slow down. Say slow down. <laughs> Slower is faster and less is more. A lot of times with seeking the Lord. And just go through each one of these. Uh, a and F and R, and there's a lot of verse references for you to look at, and it's as simple as taking the verses, looking at them, and talking to God about them. Journal if you want to journal, sit there in silence. So it's like, okay, I acknowledge you within me, Holy Spirit, and you know you can you know, pray Ephesians three sixteen. Okay, according to the riches of His glory. Oh wait a second, what what is the riches of His glory? I don't, even know, I don't even know what that is. You know, you can get to, when you really slow down, you can get to thinking about it. Um, but then to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Okay, so for me to be, you want me to be strengthened with power in my inner man, but it's through the spirit. Okay, do that. And then you, I just sit there in silence. I'm bored. 
I don't feel that much. I'm thinking about what I want to (laughs) eat, whatever. And then I just sit there for a little bit, and then I move on down to the next phrase. It's that simple. And sometimes you'll feel like the spirit of revelation and all these connections and all that stuff, and that's cool. Sometimes you won't feel much of anything, but you reap what you sow. And so it's just a matter of being diligent with it. And so you can thank God for it. You can just ask God in prayer. You can pray in tongues. You can sit in silence. Those are all just different ways to engage, which we'll unpack those in future weeks in more detail. So just do that, the AFR, and just look up the verse references. If you finish that for some reason, um, go and look up the John 5, 19 through 20, and the John 15 verses, which are... Um, in the notes just above this. Any questions?